Hello, everybody, and welcome to Bible Study. I'm R.K. Brown, and I'm glad to be with you. So tonight's lesson is going to be for the unbeliever. Very often, I teach lessons to teach people just how to deeper, deeper, more deeply, there we go, more deeply understand the Bible. And I believe that that's important, and I don't believe there's enough of that going around. I mean, I know there are Bible studies in churches, and I actually went to a Bible study on Wednesday night at uh, Holiday Heights Baptist Church in Hendersonville, and it was a good Bible study. I actually learned something, and it blessed me, actually. I actually got something out of it. So, um, you know, because uh, oftentimes these days, that's not the case where people are teaching in such a way that I can learn from it. You know, everything's just real, like, super basic, you know. There are people around that are like me that need a little more. You know, in Hebrews, the end of Hebrews chapter 5 and beginning of Hebrews chapter 6, the Bible commands us to move away from the basic elements of the gospel and move into deeper things. It's a command. And then the Apostle Paul or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, and we, you know, pretty much everybody believes that was Paul, even though there's not a, an identifying um, statement or anything like that. The writer tells us, to move on past the basic elements of the gospel and, you know, being saved from dead works and the laying on of hands and baptisms and all that stuff and to move into deeper things. And he, and he gets on to him and says, y'all, y'all ought to be teachers right now and y'all have need that somebody feed you with milk. We don't want to be like that. However, tonight I am going to preach to the unbeliever and particularly to those people who have heard the gospel continually. I believe personally that, okay, when I was a Calvinist, I was a Calvinist for 20 years. When I was a Calvinist, I did absolutely believe in the preaching of the gospel. I did absolutely believe that people couldn't lose their salvation because I just, I just it didn't make sense that, that you could believe on Christ and lo lose your salvation. Anyway, so, I, you know, I believe, I believe that the basic elements of the gospel, even when I was a Calvinist, a lot of Calvinists don't believe in the preaching of the gospel, and that's ridiculous, seeing as how we have the Great Commission. That's insane. That's pretty much an, an unbeliever, in my opinion. So, um, well, I've sort of lost my train of thought. So I guess I'll go into the lesson, and if it comes to me, I'll, I'll give it to you. So I'm going to start out with some scripture that tells you that you don't need to be ignoring the gospel. I'm going to show you what happens when people don't believe. There is a doctrine called reprobation. And reprobate means to be rejected. Now you often hear me talk about reprobation in the in the, you know, in the sort of the context of the sodomites. But you don't have to be a sodomite to be a reprobate. And there may come a time in your life when God has given you the gospel over and over, and I just now remember what I was going to say. So let me finish this. There may come a time in your life when God has given you the gospel over and over and over, and you reject it, and he rejects you. People say that as long as there's a breath in somebody, there's still a chance. That is not true. There are people who are given over to reprobation long before they leave this earth, that they have already been rejected of God. It's in the scriptures. I'm going to show you a little piece of it tonight. So I, did I lose my thought again? I believe that the Bible, in, like in Ephesians chapter 2, for instance, says that ye who were dead in your trespasses and sins, hath he, God, quickened or made alive. Right? So God has made you alive when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And so the Calvinist would say, well, how dead is dead? If you're dead in your trespasses and sins, a dead man can't do anything. But I don't believe that that's correct. I believe that when the gospel comes to somebody, God gives them light that they can see. He kind of raises them from the dead so they can hear the gospel. And that's why Jude, when he talks about those false teachers coming in, that they're twice dead and plucked up by the roots. They heard the gospel, they understood the gospel, and they rejected the gospel. So they're twice dead, plucked up by the roots. As I heard a Bible teacher one time say, they've got the second death in them. I believe that God raises people from the dead when they hear the gospel. And if they reject the gospel, then they die and they're twice dead. And the second death will destroy them. 
when the second death act they're they're kind of in the same way that we are in the new Jerusalem by faith they are dead by not faith even though they haven't experienced that full second death yet by the lake of fire which I'll show you what that is I'll show you the second death in this lesson even though they haven't fully experienced it they are already in the lake of fire by their lack of faith, where we are already in the New Jerusalem by our abundance of faith, by our having faith. So, we go to John chapter 12, where the Bible tells us, starting at verse 37, But though he, Jesus, had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, that's Isaiah, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. Did you hear what I said? Give me your undivided attention. Verse 39, therefore they could not believe. Have you ever heard anybody say that before? That they could not believe. Now, obviously, some of you that listen to this lesson, yeah, of course, you've heard me say it. <laughs> Therefore, they could not believe. Because that Isaiah the prophet said again, He hath blinded their eyes, he being God, and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes and understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. These things spake Isaiah when he saw his glory, his glory being Jesus, and spake of him. So Isaiah had already predicted that they would be blinded. Now God didn't just blind them because he wanted to blind them like the Calvinists might believe. God blinded them because they continually rejected the gospel that though he had done so many miracles among them, yet they believed not. They did not want the gospel. Whatever they wanted and called it having to do with God, they didn't want the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 15 that, uh, well spake Isaiah the prophet when he said that this people's lips, uh, how did he say it? Um, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And he said, well spake Isaiah the prophet when he said that. So they honored God with their lips, but their heart was far from him. They didn't want him. They didn't want the salvation that he offered. They wanted something else. They wanted, you know, Israel to be taken from the Roman Empire and, you know, that they be a totally sovereign nation again and all that kind of thing. And But they didn't want the salvation that Jesus came to bring us. So John chapter 8, 20 tells us this. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. <laughs> he says, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and die in your sins. But they're not seeking him for salvation. Whatever they're seeking him for, it's not salvation, because if you seek Jesus, you will find him. Whoever seeks, finds, he says in Matthew, was a chapter six, and maybe again in Luke chapter six, Luke chapter seven, something like that, once in the Sermon on the Mount and once in the Sermon on the Plain. So if you seek him, you will find him. So however they're seeking him, they're not seeking him for his words, for salvation. They're probably seeking him. He's probably saying that they're seeking him. They'll die in your sins and you'll seek me and, and you won't find me because they're seeking him to try to harass him more. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. If you don't believe 
the gospel. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I'm going to show you what the gospel is very clearly here in just a few minutes. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, He is the Christ. The Christ, the word Christ means Messiah. We see that clearly when the woman at the well says that we know that Messiah shall come, which is Christ. So, the Bible clearly defines that Christ is Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one, and Jesus certainly is the anointed one. He sits on the throne of David and governs Israel forever. And when I say Israel, I don't mean the land over there. I mean the people. And the people are whoever believe on Jesus Christ. As Galatians 16, verse 6, I'm sorry, Galatians 6, verse 16 says, The Israel of God. The real, true Israel. I believe that Israel was always spiritual. There was the you know land of Israel where the spiritual people dwelt. But Israel has always been spiritual. Always. There was always people that lived on the land of Israel that weren't saved. And Israel that lived on the land of Israel that was saved. And even Gentiles came in to the land of Israel and they believed on God. Of course, they were circumcised and all that stuff to be in the land. But they believed on God and they were saved. And everybody is saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Everybody from the foundation of the world has always been saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, if y'all don't believe that I am he, the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God, the God-man, that you will die in your sins. And if you die in your sins, you're lost and headed for hell. You're lost and you're going to hell. I don't know any other way to say it. This is a salvation message. And like I said earlier, particularly for those who have heard the gospel over and over and continue to reject it. Uh, let me give this one more scripture and hopefully I'll remember what I want to say next. Now after, okay, this is Mark 1.14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Oh, this is perfect. This leads perfectly into what I want to say. And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. So, you have two ways that you can understand that. He's saying, Repent ye, y'all repent, and believe the gospel. Ye means y'all. It means a group of people. I say this all the time that in the King James Bible, the T words, thee, thou, thine, are always talking to an individual and ye, you, yours, that kind of thing. So I was talking to a group. He's talking to a group of people. So he's saying, y'all repent and believe the gospel. So now is he saying like the Church of Christ, which I, which to the best of my knowledge, this is what they believe, that you have to clean your life up to come to Jesus, that you got to turn from your sin, that you have to repent of your sin, but that's not what the Bible, that's not what Jesus just said. He said, repent and believe. The word repent in the Greek is the word metanoia. It comes from two Greek words. It's a compound word. It comes from two Greek words. Meta, which means to change, like metamorphosis, and nous, which is your mind or your thinking. And when you put them together, it makes a compound word, metanoia, and that means to change your thinking or change your mind. So Jesus is saying, Change your mind and believe the gospel. So what is the implication of that? The implication is change your thinking, turn from your unbelief, and believe. Change your mind from unbelief and believe the gospel. It's really as simple as that. And I believe with all my heart that preachers everywhere, not all preachers, obviously. I know the independent, most of the independent fundamental Baptists believe like I do. But I believe preachers everywhere teach, essentially, even if they don't mean to, they kind of teach that you got to clean yourself up and come to God, that you got to change your life, that you got to be willing to follow Jesus. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says repent and believe the gospel. And when you repent and believe the gospel, and you really do believe the gospel, then according to Ephesians 1.13, which I quote all the time, then after that ye believed, you were sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption. And once you receive that Holy Ghost, you have the Spirit of God in you. Then the Spirit of God begins to start working on you and making you willing to follow Christ. That's not something that you just automatically have 
you know, that you have to be willing to follow Jesus. That's not true. Not for salvation. It is only true that you must put your trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to be saved. That is the gospel. Now, I would move on to 1 Corinthians 15 where I would describe the gospel to you, but I woke up this morning. I was actually going to preach about something else. I was actually going to preach about the fact that Chick-fil-A hired a, a, a DEI officer, which is a diversity, equity, and inclusion vice president, because people are reporting that like that just now happened because of the Bud Light thing and because of the Target thing, but actually Chick-fil-A did that back in 2020, so I'm not going to mess with it. And I was going to touch on the fact that the Latin word DEI or day actually is the singular plural, or I'm sorry, not plural, the singular Latin word for God, day. And so like uh, I used to hear this, this, when I was a Calvinist, I used to hear this uh, this theologian named R.C. Sproul. I think he's passed on now, but he used to talk, he used to use the word quorum day or before God, like you do your you live your life quorum day. You live your life before God, right? And the word day is D I or D E I. And so I heard Tim Poole on Timcast, which the guy's not even a Christian, but he had the good sense to say, I know what they're doing when they have this D E I thing, this diversity, equity, inclusion thing. They're trying to get you to worship another God. They're trying to get you to follow the religion of wokeness. They're trying to get you to worship their God. That's why they use that acronym, D-E-I, or day, because like I said, the word day is the Latin singular word for God. So that's what I was going to preach, but then I woke up this morning, and this scripture or a reasonable facsimile thereof was burning in my brain. And I hit the snooze alarm several times because it's the Lord's day, and I just slept a little late. And I'm kind of between churches right now. I'm kind of looking for a King James only church in Nashville. If you, if you know about one, please let me know. King James only. So uh, yeah, I am looking for a church. So anyway, um, so I woke up with this scripture or a, a reasonable facsimile there of First Timothy. Well, it should be one fifteen. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if he came in to save sinners, he came in to save them from something. And what he came in to save them from was the wrath of God for rejecting Jesus Christ, the one who came to save you. And the wrath of God is hell for those who reject the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, let me just uh, go off on a little rabbit trail real quick. So, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So, in that verse above, when Jesus, when the Apostle Paul said, uh, You know, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The reason he says he's the chief of sinners is because he was persecuting the church and wasting it beyond measure. I mean, like he was putting the hammer down on the churches, on the Christians. But listen to how these read. This is like reads like one paragraph. It's pretty cool. Now, I, I suppose you could take, you could do, you could use this concept and make you know, make any kind of doctrine you want out of the scriptures. But this is not what I'm doing. You can read the context and see that this is not what I'm doing. But I love when scripture happens like this, where you can take two verses in totally different places and read them consecutively, and they read like one paragraph. Check this out. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So that's why he's saying he's the chief of sinners. I'm not pulling that out of context. If you study on it, you can see why Paul said that, because he persecuted the church and wasted it, right? Okay, So, but the important thing for this lesson is that he said that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
I've used this scripture a lot in lessons, but remember that I'm talking to those of you specifically who are unbelievers who continue to hear the gospel and you continue to reject it. And I showed you how that God at some point is done with it and he's done with your rejection and he'll give you over to a reprobate mind. So I'm going to give you the gospel. I'm going to take you a little ways down the Romans road, as it is called, and then I'm going to show you that you don't want to continue to reject the gospel. Those who reject the gospel basically don't they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. And so they, you know, they maybe try to replace him with idols or or maybe another Jesus or maybe just a, a God without Jesus. God ain't going to be found without his only begotten son Jesus Christ. He sent God into the world to die for your sins and to re- be raised from the dead so that you may be saved. Jesus took your place in death. And I'll show you what death is in a little while. He took your place in death. And therefore, if you put your trust in him, not just believe a bunch of facts, oh, sure, I believe that Jesus died. My, my mama was a Christian, so yeah, I believe it. No, you have to believe it for you. You have to believe that it's for you. You don't get saved on your mom, holding on to your mama's dress, you know. You get saved by believing the gospel, by holding on to your mom's apron. There we go. You don't get saved by holding on to your mom's apron. You get saved by believing on Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. I'm declaring unto you the gospel. Which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. You hear me? You're saved by believing the gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. I've touched on that before. I won't touch on that tonight. I won't go down that rabbit trail. Just believe the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that, all right, here it is. Here's the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and how that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. By the way, those who knock on the Bible, that's the only way you know about the things of God. If you believe that God is talking to you, like you're hearing the audible voice of God or whatever, you know, people in asylums believe that. People in the crazy house, as it is, you know, slangly called, believe that God is talking to them. But I'll tell you this, and he did speak to the prophets in times past. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, that in, in uh, how does he say it, in in diverse ways and at sundry times God spake to the to to us by the prophets but now in these last days has spoken to us by his son by whom by whom also he hath made the world so in the in time past he did speak to the prophets directly but now we have the bible and God speaks to everybody on earth the same way it only matters if you can hear it and how much you've sought God in the scriptures and by prayer to whether you can understand it. The depth of your understanding is based on whether or not you have, you know, been studying on the Bible and praying and seeking his face. But he speaks to everybody the same. No scripture, you know, no scripture of the prophecy, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. God speaks to everybody the same. Just it depends on how deep you can hear it or not. But... The scripture has told us about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and that is what you must put your trust in in order to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner. You are a sinner. And everybody on earth is a sinner. And, you know, there's not a, how did Solomon say it in Ecclesiastes? I believe it's in Ecclesiastes that there's not a just man upon the face of the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That's either in the Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. I think Ecclesiastes. There's not a just man upon the face of the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And First John 1.10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us because the word just told you all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you say you have not sinned, God's word's not in you. 
You need to hear me. You need to believe that you have sinned against God and you need the blood of Jesus Christ to atone for you and that God raised him from the dead, that he was buried, he was died for our sins and that he was raised for our justification. That Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose the third day and he was raised and prove that, that Jesus was raised from the dead is proof that if you put your trust in what Jesus did for you, that God will raise you from the dead at the resurrection. Not like the third day after you die or anything like that, unless that happens to be when the resurrection takes place. But God will raise you from the dead at the resurrection because he raised Jesus from the dead, guaranteeing that he will do the same for us if we trust in his son, Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, and there is no other. God did not put Jesus on the cross and cause him to die. And the Bible actually says in, in Isaiah, I believe Isaiah 53, that it pleased God to bruise him. It pleased God to do that for us. God loved us so much, you know. For God loved, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, right? So, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Let's focus on that first part. For the wages of sin is death. But even Christians that are not alive and remain at the coming of Christ, our flesh will die. If I'm not alive and remain at the coming of Christ, I'm 60 years old right now. You know, who knows how long I have left, you know. I, I try to take care of myself and, you know, I exercise and eat okay and uh, so I try to take care of myself and and uh, you know I want to live for a long time I, you know I pray that I can live to like 105 I remember when I turned 52 and a half that I said okay I'm at the halfway point right now and I, and I hope that's true as long as I can keep my you know move around decently and keep my mental faculties you know if I lose either one of those and I don't think I would want to live that long you know not in this sinful flesh. But um, anyway, the wages of sin is death. And when he talks about death, even Christians die physically, right? So we're not talking about that. We're talking about the second death. In Revelation 20.14, the Bible says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Let's, let's keep looking. Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I wish I had thought to put the scripture in it, which is in Romans chapter 3, let God be true and every man a liar. I believe that's 3.10. Could be wrong about that, but leave it to 310, Romans 310. But if you haven't done anything else on this list, if you haven't been an unbeliever, of course, you know, if you go to hell, it's because you're an unbeliever. If you haven't been abominable, if you haven't been a murderer, if you haven't been a whoremonger, if you haven't been a sorcerer, if you haven't been an idolater, you have been a liar. Because the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. The, 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 you know, we've all, yeah, and you know you've lied. You know you've lied about something. The scripture says, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So when the Bible says the wages of sin is death, that's what it's talking about. But the Bible also says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So faith in Jesus Christ will deliver you from that death, from that second death. I hope that makes sense. I hope I'm getting that across to you. I had somebody tell me recently that this person said, well, you can be condescending because you'll over explain something and then say, does that make sense? And I think the reason that I, I, I told this person that it's because I don't feel like I convey the message. And, I, you know, I, I remember somebody telling me when I was about 19 years old one time, this real intellectual dude 
told me, you, you repeat yourself a lot, and I think because I don't feel like I get my words across. Or maybe I feel like maybe people don't listen to me. I don't know if it's an insecurity or if it's just that I feel like I don't get my words across. But either way, so when I said, does that make sense? I'm not trying to be condescending or anything like that. I just sometimes I feel like I don't get my message across. Moving on. So Romans, so given the fact that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, the Bible tells us, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, while we were way out of the way, while we were unbelievers, that Christ died for us. While we were unbelievers, we were the enemies of God and he died for us. Peter said it in a slightly deeper way. In 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So there's the gospel right there, that he was put to death for sins in the flesh, but he was quickened by the Spirit. God raised him from the dead. From that point on, he had a spiritual body, but it's, but it's still flesh and bone. Not flesh and blood, but flesh and bone. John says, I believe in, in 1 John chapter 3, that we know not what he is like, but we know that when we're with him, we shall be like him. We will have flesh and bone, but it'll be a new resurrected body that, you know, the, the Bible tells us that the life of an animal or of a person or whatever, the life is in the blood. We won't have that life blood. Our life will be totally by the Spirit of God without the blood carrying that life oxygen that without the blood carrying the breath of life through our body to our organs sustaining life it's not going to be like that in the resurrection so Romans 10 and 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So that goes right on the heels of what Peter said, because, you know, again, Peter said uh, that Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in his flesh. There's that he died for sin, but quickened by the Spirit. There's the resurrection. So, that if thou shalt confess that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There would be no need to believe in the resurrection if you didn't believe that Jesus died for your sins. There would be no need for that. So it all goes together, even though the Apostle Paul said you know, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you wouldn't even have a need to believe that except that you know you're a sinner and that Jesus died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead. He died for your sins and he was raised for your justification. Right? Right on? Right on. So... I put this scripture in to say this. Think of me, not obviously not as, a, not as an apostle like the Apostle Paul, but think of me as a worker of God bringing the gospel to you. So the apostle says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, We then, as workers together with him, Jesus Christ, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee, in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee or secured thee. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time for you to believe the gospel. Don't put it off. Don't keep putting it off. I'm not telling you that you have to turn over a new leaf and turn away from all your sins and all that kind of stuff. Jesus will deal with your sin. Believe me. If you truly put your trust in Jesus Christ, He will deal with you. We sing in the Baptist we sing in the Baptist churches all the time, just as I am without one plea. I say this all the time. We sing that in the Baptist churches, and then we tell people that, well, you got to be willing to follow Jesus, just as I am. The only difference is that you believe, you trust in Jesus Christ. 
Lord, I trust you. I come to you just as I am. Save me. Like the man in the in the temple, the Pharisee went down to the temple and a publican or a tax collector went down to the temple. Jesus told the parable and he said that the tax collector said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not as other men. I'm not, uh, I'm not an adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. I fast twice a week. I give all, you know, I give tithes of all that I have. And the publican, the tax collector, just wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he smote upon his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He didn't say, I'll turn over a new leaf. He didn't say, I'm willing to follow you. He said, have mercy on me. And when he has mercy on you, when you believe, you put your trust in what Jesus died for you, that he was buried that he, that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose the third day. When you put your trust in that and you are sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption, I promise you that Jesus will deal with you according to your sins. Just come to Jesus as you are. He will deal with you according to your sins. And if you really truly put your trust in Him, He will not let you fall away. You will not fall away. He will not let you. He knows how to secure you. He knows how to keep you if you trust in Him. Now, there are those that make a profession of faith, but I don't really believe that they trust in Him. I don't really believe they have Jesus down deep inside of them because if they did, they wouldn't fall away. There are those that the Bible says fall away, but it's because they never were saved. So, now, is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, there may not be a tomorrow for you. You may go out and die in a car accident tonight or step out in front of a bus or <clears throat> just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time when some crazed, whacked-out gunman comes in and shoots up a place and you take the bullet. You take one of the bullets. Or you have a heart attack. Or you have a stroke or you just for some unknown reason die in your sleep, <laughs> or I'll just put this out there, or you spontaneously combust. <laughs> I thought I'd throw that in there. It just hit my mind, so I thought I'd put that out there. Today is the day of salvation. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now that particular scriptures written in the context of the sodomites, you know, that God gave them over to do those particular things, but it applies across the board. You don't have to be a sodomite to be a reprobate. Of course, if you are a sodomite, you are a reprobate. You're already rejected of God. Reprobate means rejected. But at some point, God's going to have enough of your rejection if he hasn't already. Now is the day of salvation because they did not like, because when they did not like to retain God in their, because, how, did he say, how did he say it? And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge and God gave them over to a reprobate mind. God rejected them and he gave them over to a mind that they no longer could Believe. Remember that scripture that I showed you in John chapter 12, verse 39? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He, God, hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Now is the day of salvation. Stop rejecting the call of God. Believe the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Stop it. Stop rejecting the call of God. Believe. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ. Believe. That's my lesson. So if you're watching by Facebook, YouTube, Gab TV, Gab Social, Rumble, Truth Social, BitChute. Or did I do it? I did it wrong. Rumble, Truth Social. Bit you. Okay, there I did it right. <laughs> I'm looking at it backwards, so I'm reading them kind of backwards. Anyway, um, if you're watching by any one of these, I don't put anything new on on um, 
Gab TV anymore or Gab, but I still got stuff up there from old. I don't do it anymore. It's just, a, it's a headache. It's a hassle. Uh, anyway, I've talked about it before. I'm not going into it again. I hope you got something out of this lesson. I hope that if you started out with this lesson as an unbeliever, I hope that you have given in to the call and just say like that sinner did, God have mercy on me, a sinner. God have mercy on me. I believe the gospel Jesus have mercy on me. Call on him. And if you really have trusted in him, he'll be there to answer that call. He will not reject you if you really want to be saved. He will not turn you away. Whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Good night. God bless you. Lord willing, I'll see you next week.